This is Rob Cowell, Chief Medical Officer of Medtronic's Cardiac Rhythm and Heart Failure Division. I wanted to take some time today to talk about reactive ATP and some recent data where we leveraged our large CareLink database of devices to try to get a better understanding of how well reactive ATP works in a real-world setting. But before getting into that, I want to take a step back and talk about the history of device-based algorithms to treat atrial fibrillation. Many of these algorithms date back to even before I was an EP fellow, and they were roundly disappointing in how well they worked or really didn't work. But from a lot of that information came reactive ATP, which called upon the idea that in some patients, atrial fibrillation can slow or organize at different times. And if burst pacing or ramp pacing is done into those times when the rhythm slows, there's a chance that that can terminate. And we've all seen that uh, if you've done AFib ablations where there'll be persistent atrial fibrillation and then suddenly you'll look at the monitor and see slowing or organization of the rhythm. And when you try to pace into it, you can actually capture and even sometimes terminate. And that's the basis of the reactive ATP algorithm. That algorithm was studied in a randomized trial called MINERVA. The MINERVA trial randomized 1,166 pacemaker patients, all of whom had at least five minutes of atrial fibrillation to one of three arms, DDDR mode, MVP mode, or MVP mode with atrial therapies turned on as well. The MINERVA trial showed some interesting findings. The patients who were in the atrial therapy arm showed a reduction in the composite endpoint, and in addition showed a reduction in the incidence of atrial fibrillation episodes that lasted either one, seven, or beyond 30 days. But the trial also showed some economic benefits as well. The patients in the arm that had the atrial therapies on also had fewer AF-related hospitalizations and AF-related ER visits. And finally, they had fewer need for cardioversion. Interestingly, there was no difference when you looked at short episodes of atrial fibrillation lasting six hours or less comparing any of the arms. And this is exactly what you'd expect since most of those episodes would be paroxysmal and stop on their own without the need for an intervention from one of these algorithms. But one of the questions came up, was reactive ATP actually the cause of this benefit or uh, were the other algorithms important? So in one sub-study, reactive ATP was looked at specifically. In this sub-study, reactive ATP was successful at terminating about 44% of the events. And interestingly, if you then categorize the patients by whether reactive ATP terminated more than 44% of events or less than 44% of events, as you might expect, those that had a higher degree of termination also at a higher freedom from the incidence of atrial fibrillation lasting seven days or longer. So as with any study, Minerva had its limitations. First off, the patients were only pacemaker patients. Secondly, the control arm, the DDDR arm, had a higher degree of ventricular pacing than the other arms. Uh, and finally, the uh, treatment arm had multiple algorithms on and not just reactive ATP. So we wanted to come at uh, the question in a little bit different way and see if we could find real-world data that looked at patients with multiple types of devices, as well as looking at the algorithm focused itself uh, to see whether we could uh, support the Minerva data uh, in a different way. And that's where we called upon CareLink. As you know, CareLink is a large database of patients with multiple types of devices that are followed longitudinally. So what we did is, was as follows. We looked for patients who had at least five minutes of atrial fibrillation, like the Minerva trial, and who either had reactive ATP on for two consecutive years or not on for two consecutive years, and then compared those patients for outcomes. But because there's some inherent bias in the uh, CareLink database, and it's, there's no randomization, we tried to create a randomization by matching patients. And those patients with either reactive ATP on or off were matched in the following manner, by age, sex, device type, algorithm, percent V pacing, uh, and uh, duration of atrial fibrillation or burden of atrial fibrillation. 
So the match groups of reactive ATP or control had about 4,016 patients each and were followed for two years. In those groups, uh, reactive ATP showed a reduction in the incidence of atrial fibrillation events, whether you looked at events lasting one day or more, seven days or more, or 30 days or more. Mirroring the Minerva study, uh, and as you might expect, the seven-day period showed the greatest benefit with an, about an 8% absolute reduction in the incidence of AFib episodes and a 40% relative reduction versus the control. Interestingly, whether we looked at subgroups uh, based on device type, age, or other parameters, reactive ATP fared better than the control in all subgroups. As with any study leveraging big data, there are limitations. First off, it's not a randomized study. So in any given individual, we don't know why reactive ATP was programmed on or off. Secondly, we don't have clinical records, so we don't know to what extent a physician's intervention may have affected the outcomes we are measuring. But that doesn't take away from the overall uh, excitement about a study like this, where a large uh, real-world clinical data set very closely mirrored the results of a randomized clinical trial. And not only that, it showed that those results were similar across a variety of devices. Going forward, I really think this is going to be a powerful tool for us to use in the future.